Thanks so much for joining us for another edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel, where we discuss everything and anything cannabis-related so that we can have the help to get the right information to you as you try to navigate the space, especially some of you out there who I know are walking into dispensaries and have no idea what you really want to try or to buy. And some of you have even said that, you know, you don't find a lot of the people that we call bud tenders as helpful as they should be. And so what I'm trying to make sure I do is get you some information to help you be steeped in the right knowledge that you need to have to make a decision for you and your family. And today I am so blessed to have on our show a founding doctor of the American Cannabinoid Clinics in Portland, Maine, um, and also at Portland, Oregon, correct, doctor? Portland, Oregon. In Portland, Oregon. And she's the, the mother of two fellow physicians, a wife of another physician who are all a part of this clinic, and a doctor who I think really doesn't need as much introduction to those of you who understand the cannabis space, but for those who don't, please welcome Dr. Janice Knox to our, our podcast. And thank you so much, doctor, for being here with me today. Well, my pleasure. Absolutely. Let's let's jump right into this and get into, you know, you are a doctor, you were trained, uh, your undergraduate work was done at where, at the uh, University of Berkeley? Yeah, I, I did undergraduate work at Berkeley. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, mm-hmm. and I grew up with a very religious family. So going mm-hmm. to Berkeley was a little different, because if you understand anything about the Berkeley culture, a right. big part of that culture was about drugs, including sure. marijuana. Yeah, the counterculture in a way. But then you went ahead and got your graduate degree as a doctor from? Yes, I did. After leaving Berkeley, I went on to University of Washington and got my medical degree and my MBA degree a few years later. Okay, and you're, you were a specialist as an anesthesiologist for a lengthy, I'm not going to try to date you, but <laughs> a multi-decade career. That's right, that's right. I spent 35 years as what I call a legalized drug pusher. Another name being a board-certified anesthesiologist. I spent 35 years doing anesthesia. And working in, 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 you know, actually, though, you may, we we make light of and say a certified drug dealer, but doing what you felt at the time the best way to help patients get through not only surgeries but post-surgeries and live a normal life. Absolutely. You know, that's one of the things that I felt very strongly about anesthesia, that I did make a difference. However, as the years pass, and I'm looking at the direction healthcare is going, and I finally realized that even with some of the surgical procedures that are being performed, a lot of them are really still topical procedures. I was helping because those patients went to sleep and would wake up. Hopefully, they woke up. Um, but most of the medicine was geared toward topical treatment, even some of those surgeries. Now, granted, if a patient needs an appendix out, appendix needs to come out. That's the way it is. But most things were just temporizing kind of surgery. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of frustrating for me towards the end of my career. And you, you know, let's make sure everybody understands that an anesthesiologist works not only in pharmacology, but also in psychology, correct? Oh, it's, a, it's all of the above. I got my undergraduate degree in psychology from Berkeley, and it couldn't have come uh, more handy to me as an anesthesiologist because our job is to go in there and get those patients comfortable enough to trust us to put them to sleep. And believe it or not, the way those patients went to sleep psychologically, if they were fearful, made a huge difference on the way they would wake up, how much pain that would, they would have, you know, the anxiety levels, the stress level. So having that psychology education really helped me be who my patients needed me to be. Absolutely. And I should also add another, another layer to that is not only did you know psychology, pharmacology, but also physiology. You have to understand physiology Absolutely. to be able to be an anesthesiologist, right? Absolutely. We take the edge of death, you know, from all ages, from newborns to, you know, 90 plus years old with um, being healthy to be the most sick people in the world with pages of medication. So it's our job as anesthesiologists to juggle all those balls. And and whatever we receive, it was our job to get that patient safely through an anesthetic. So we have to know physiology and pharmacology. Great. So, I mean, after, after really a very successful 35-year career, you retire, and, and we're about to get on to the good days. And then <laughs> you started to, to get some, some, some questions from people and patients. 
that were coming in and asking you questions about cannabis. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting story. Going back to when I grew up, very religious family, we didn't talk about drugs. Going to Berkeley, I never saw anyone, knew anyone, never participated in uh, using cannabis or marijuana, as it was called during that time. So going through uh, an anesthesia career, and then retiring and, and working in one of those clinics where they, you know, they give the, the, um, the evaluation that they will qualify to get a medical marijuana card. You know, that was a big jump for me because, number one, I didn't believe in marijuana. I didn't believe in cannabis. And I thought that these people were just really coming to get my signature so they can use this marijuana legally. I mean, that's what I thought. They were Rossiferian, tie-dyed shirts, Birkenstocks. So I had an opinion of these people. But when I got to that clinic, I was shocked. I mean, my conventional medical world was rock to a core because that's not who I saw come in. I saw doctors, retired doctors and lawyers and business people, grandmothers and grandfathers and people bringing their babies in and teenagers in. And I was shocked. More importantly, these people were looking for a different quality of life and they were looking for someone who could guide them in the safe use of this medication, not someone who would judge them. Well, I had already judged them because I knew what they looked like. But right. That was well, you know, one of the things I, I, I didn't thought know, was... didn't know how to answer their questions. Here I was, I, you know, in physiology and physics and pharmacology, but I couldn't answer them. And you said that was kind of humiliating and humbling at the same time, right? And very humiliating and humbling. I mean, how does a person who spent 35 years pushing drugs, you know, taking care of patients, not be able to understand, or, or I mean, I didn't know the language, I didn't know cannabinoids, sativa, none of that. All that was new to me. How could I be that anesthesiologist, knowing physiology and pharmacology, and not answer these questions? And the patients knew I didn't know. Right. So, I mean, yeah. that, that, of course, I, that's a wake-up call for anybody when, you know, that's people right. coming in the room know a little bit more than you do and you're supposed to be the expert. <laughs> so you set about doing what you do as a doctor, and that was doing the requisite research, correct? Right. I've always been a very uh, curious, goal-oriented person, and my kids laugh at me all the time, what is mom doing now? <laughs> um, so I refuse to be put in that position where I cannot answer a question that I felt like I should have been able to. So I started reading about what was this cannabis thing all about? And the more I read, then I'm thinking, okay, why in the world did we kick, kick off the American Pharmacopeia? So then I went back on my tail and did the research and read the congressional records and was more shocked and angry, not only as a physician, but also as a consumer. My mother passed away 30 years prior because of breast cancer. I lost my first child to anoxic brain damage. Might have this information helped me to help them? More importantly, as an anesthesiologist, there's some part of that I could have used to decrease stress, decrease anxiety, decrease inflammation preoperatively, and then postoperatively decrease stress, inflammation, and hopefully keep some of these people off of these um, opioids. But we weren't allowed to learn that. So that really motivated me. You know, I'm not the typical person who had a reason to use cannabis or to get on cannabis, but I was so motivated and angry about how we had been cheated out of this very valuable information that I just made it my life to, to get into the cannabis space. Well, you know, and it's very interesting the way you said it cheated out of the information that was really necessary to help, you know, patients. And I, I have, I've been known to, and I'm going to say it again here on this podcast right now, I think, you know, there's a discussion going on right now in the country about, you know, whether or not they, they use this term recreational use or adult use and then mm -hmm. medical use. But I've been very, very pointed in saying, and I'm going to say it and ask you what you think about it, but I really believe that the person, you know, maybe some people come to the table, uh, you know, because they want to experience a euphoria. Okay, let's mm -hmm. let's say that, and I'm going to say that that's, to me, and this is just Montel talking, but I think that's probably less than 10% of the people who are using cannabis right now today. And the reason why I say that is because I think the person makes a choice between alcohol and cannabis. They really mm -hmm. are making that choice because there's an underlying medical issue or underlying issue that they may not even admit to themselves mm -hmm. is the reason why they've made the choice between cannabis and alcohol for that buzz. They, they recognize right. that once they experienced the euphoria that they were able to achieve from cannabis, they recognize that that was in some way, shape, or form less threatening to them or less deleterious to them than an alcohol. 
euphoria. That's and so right. they, then they went ahead not even knowing that I'm really treating that symptom of anxiety that I have in the evenings that I didn't even wasn't even aware of, but I'm using this as a way to do so. But I really am nothing more than a recreational user. And I think that's, that's something correct. that we've got to get doctors to understand. That's correct. And I, we totally agree. We feel like everyone who uses cannabis, whether they recognize it or aware of it or not, they probably are treating something the body is asking for. We have gotten away from uh, uh, understanding the language of our bodies, and we have something called the endocannabinoid system. And what we try to push, particularly to healthcare providers of all types, that when you really get down to it, Montel, it's about that endocannabinoid system. And for our listeners out there, we got to let's let's stop right there for just a second and explain to them what the endocannabinoid system is. For people who are listening, you have to understand that mammals, and we found an endocannabinoid system in dolphins and in other mammals. Mammals mm-hmm. have a, uh, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call it a secondary sympathetic nervous system that mm-hmm. is made up of receptors that are excited by or antagonized by or actually respond to cannabinoids found in plant matter to help us literally produce our own cannabinoids inside of our body. If you've never smoked marijuana in your life, never consumed a marijuana product in your life, you could be tested, blood tested, and you would be able to identify in very, very small amounts things that are called endocannabinoids, uh, anandamide and 2-AG. And we now know after 20 years of study, 20 years of study, this is not something that came up yesterday, 20 years of study, we know that the endocannabinoid system is responsible for what we call cellular homeostasis. And for those who are saying, Monta, stop using all the big words. Okay, (laughs) so for for making the cells in our body actually operate and function, at the neutral or let's call it the Goldilocks zone. I mean, not too hot, not too too cold, but operating and functioning just right. And we recognize now that not having endocannabinoids at the proper level in our body is probably, and we're going to find this out in another 10 or 15 years, that is probably responsible for a lot of the illness or disease that we see in the body today. That's so, correct. Right? So, I mean, but, but Doc, Absolutely. I mean, you know, and I'm not, I'm not knocking you. I'm just saying now there is a lot of doctors who are now finally understanding and reaching out and trying to find information to understand this endocannabinoid system. And that's yes, something that you yes, built, yes. built your whole, you know, second career on. Correct? Yes. Yes. You know, and that that's so true. It's, I think they're reaching out more. It's no longer acceptable for doctors to say there's not enough research or, you know, don't do it, but don't tell me about it. That's not an acceptable response anymore. This is patient-driven, and the more physicians understand about that endocannabinoid system that actually controls every physiological system in our body, it's the reason why you're conceived, the reason why you're born, the reason why you're healthy. Physiology is built on the endocannabinoid system that consists of receptors and the transmitters uh, that you talked about the modulators and the adamide 2 ag and then the enzymes that make them and break them down that's controlling everything about us from our central nervous system to our gi tract the reproductive system our uh, hormonal system there is not a physiological system that it does not control and when it's out of whack depending on one's genetics and on environmental stressors what manifests as a disease well, because that endocannabinoid system has not been able to do its job, whether it's fibromyalgia or migraine headaches or cancer. And, you know, when we look back, at that, then when you say this, again, I'm going to start to slow you down for a second just so my listeners will understand. Folks, you've got to understand, until 1937, most people on this planet consumed cannabinoids from hemp or from the marijuana sativa plant that's around correct. the world, in some form or one way or another, we we knew that before, you know, 1937, and it was outlawed in the United States. And then we had somebody here making a mission to try to outlaw it worldwide. People it go back to the 1600s when you know That's this right. country was was discovered. You know, That's they right. came over with boatloads of seeds, and those seeds were known even back then to have some of the highest protein content of any other seed on the planet. So people That's ate right. and consumed. Ate it, ate it, 
and physically consume cannabis probably every single day, not because they were trying to get high. Some people might have tried to get high. If you think about, you know, back in the 1600s to 1700s, it was lions, tigers, and bears, oh, my, and cold, no air conditioning, no heat, you know, and we were still walking in the woods, you know, wiping our rear ends with leaves. So, you know, it was a tough time to live. You know, you couldn't drink the water. Most of the water that people were drinking back in the 1700s was near beer because we would process it and put enough alcohol in it to kill off the bacterium that was there that was causing highly distressful you know, digestive disease. And so, you know, we lived at a time, and, and again, I, I'd like to say to our listeners, you know, I mean, you got to remember, folks, that, you know, the majority of clothing, you know, the word canvas comes from cannabis. We were making tents, sails, ropes, clothing, everything, our sheets, our bedding, all the things that we actually lived with, as a society until 1937, we used, most people don't know that the entire Revolutionary Army was clothed in hemp fiber clothing. Most That's of the people correct. who head west, headed west to discover the western parts of America, headed west with wagons that were covered with cannabis, canvas, hemp based products. And they were eating a bowl of porridge in the morning that had hemp protein seeds in it because they recognized how important it was. And that was what was helping to maintain cellular homeostasis, even though we didn't even know it at the time. We didn't know and, that's a, and, and, and then we also didn't know that that's probably part of the reason why in the 1700s and 1800s we didn't see some of the forms of cancer and disease that we see now without having it as part of our mainstream diet. That is correct. That's correct. We've gotten so far away from what's natural that it, it, it's destroying, it's certainly destroying the, the uh, inhabitants of America and probably somewhat around the country, I mean around the world, but cannabis was a, a staple in people's lives. It was required in the early uh, centuries, 1600, 1700, for farmers to grow this, including George Washington and uh, Thomas Jefferson. And, you know, even the, the slave population, not only did they do cotton, but they did hemp as well. You go to Kentucky right. and look at some of that history. And they didn't only do cotton. They, they had to harvest that hemp, and that's not known in our history. But it was that scare, that, that uh, reefer madness kind of scare by politicians and uh, industrialists and ideologues who wanted to get rid of hemp for their own nefarious uh, uh, right. Selfish reasons. I mean, yeah, people don't so, know that William Randolph Hearst and Dupont were two of the main right. funders of, you know, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> the people who actually pushed to make cannabis illegal. And yeah. so now we jump to, you know, the 2019, and you know, right now in this country we have 34 states plus the District of Columbia that have passed mm -hmm. some form of cannabis law that allows mm -hmm. cannabis to be consumed. In individual right. states, for either you know lesser of a a clinical clinical I'm sorry criminal charge, and a couple of them have just reduced the fines, but others have made it legal, and now we're in a, another quandary. I think the quandary that we're in right now, doctor, and maybe you're going to talk about this a little bit because you know one of the things I know that is very important to you is education. You know we've done now a fairly decent job at making products available, but we've done I think this industry has done a disservice to Correct. people who are cannabis consumers by not making the information available, not educating the consumer. What do we mm -hmm. have to do? And I know that that's part of the reason why you decided to open up your own clinic. Correct? That's correct. That's correct. Education is huge, not only for the consumer, but everybody on the supply chain. You talk about the kind of products that are out there now. And I tell you, Montel, I probably wouldn't buy 99% of them. Number one, I think they absolutely have to be lab tested. Number two, I think they need to be adequately labeled so patients know what they're buying, not just a sativa or indica, but know the specific cannabinoids and know why you're using them. More importantly, our producers need to make products with purpose. Why are you using CBD? Why are you using THC? Why are you using CBG or, or some of the terpenes? What purpose are they supposed to do? So create products with purpose instead of just Correct. making stuff and putting it out there and people will be disillusioned, feeling it doesn't work for them because they haven't gotten the correct product. Education right, I mean, is key for everybody. 
that's part of the reason why I literally, you know, honestly threw my, my hand in to make sure, 100% disclosure here, that I have CBD products right now that are available in the marketplace and I've just reached out to and found a, uh, and getting ready to partner with a, a, a group of distributors and a manufacturing partner that understands the same thing that you just said and understands mm-hmm. that we need to be making products with purpose. I've been one who has been, you know, this long before this became the green rush or the gold rush. I mean, I've been out there yeah. in the street. You know, talking about this since back in 2000 when I was first diagnosed with MS, looking for a purpose behind the cannabis that I was consuming. I stopped, you know, just for me, for about a 10-year period of time, I stopped consuming most of the leaf matter and literally shifted over to only consuming keef because I knew that, you know, taking out the leaf, I was taking out some of the, the adverse properties of the plant and not adverse because you know nature created them that way but you know when you burn you know it's sometimes burning you know the fats and the lipids may not necessarily be the best way to ingest them ingesting them and consuming them edibly is probably the best way to consume them and i've been you know one of those people who have been on on a tear for the last 10 years trying to talk about way before we even identified cbd you know, I literally flew to Israel and, and sat down and had a conversation with Dr. Mishulam in his office, mm-hmm. in his mm-hmm. laboratory back in 2011, before anybody yeah. was even talking about CBD. And now, you know, and I, I did the podcast with Dr. Sanjay Gupta, and, you know, Dr. Gupta also admitted on my podcast that he was not trying to state during his special that CBD, CBD was the only end to all. Understanding that when he did his special, there were 60 to 100 cannabinoids that have been identified, and now research is claiming in Canada that there's about 166 cannabinoids that they've identified. And we all know that cannabinoids work in an entourage effect, and, you know, an entourage effect that is best elicited depending on the delivery system that you actually mm-hmm. have. Some of, the, some of the cannabinoids actually deteriorate very quickly if they are incinerated rather than being ingested. And so we've got to start paying attention to the science behind this as much as you know, we're an industry that wants to try to be you know, homeopathic and say that science is bad. So I need, we get to, need to stop that also. We need to get and convince this, this entire industry that science is good. There are some deleterious chemicals that are in the plant that we may want to avoid, especially when it comes to, you know, incinerating or vaping them. That's the reason why we're seeing some of the, the, the craziness that's going on right now, uh, mm-hmm. I think, across the country. There's research that's, that's shown that, you know, in a vaping situation that the fats and the lipids recondense in the lungs and form a coating. That may be part of what the problem has been when we've seen some of the vaping. So do we want to be vaping fats and lipids? No. Do we want to be vaping, you know, mangoes and 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 lemons and and oranges? No. You know, that you wouldn't roll up an orange peel and smoke it. So why would you put it in a product uh, thinking that that's safe as a vaporable product? But you could put that same terpene uh, from a fruit or a vegetable. We've been studying terpenes what for forty years. Mm-hmm. We know that there are certain terpenes that have medicinal effect and 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 you know, additional additional uh, attributes if they're ingested so why not use those kind of fruit based food based terpenes only in edible topicals tinctures and those things and use only hemp based terpenes in vaporable and smokable products and then you know eventually we're going to figure out that maybe we don't need to be smoking it at all what we probably need to be doing is eating and ingesting it more than we have been to date. That is exactly right. I liken it to people smoking steaks. You know, who smokes right. a steak? And if you look right. at, at least in my kitchen, you can see where the, you know, the condensation has carried oil and it's sticky. Well, I can imagine that happening to lungs the same way. But as you mentioned, those terpenes are also very important because they do modulate the way the cannabinoids work. And for us clinicians, and we call ourselves endocannabinologists, um, you know, with uh, practicing and uh, students of endocannabinology. So everything that's being unveiled about cannabis and the endocannabinoid system is what we consume. Now, with that being said, we understand that the method of intake is critical, and that depends on the disease process we're trying to take care of. 
So if it's something that requires an oil sublingual or a tincture, we'll do that. Edible, we'll do that. But you have to remember, those edibles also depend on the health of the GI tract. Right. If that GI right. tract is not healthy, that patient is not going to absorb that, that product the way he needs to or she needs to. So and that's, that's what we, we need to be telling people you don't need to be you don't need to be trying to consume an endocannabinoid or consume cannabinoids while you're drinking a big Coke or a big Pepsi. That's you don't right. need to do it that way. Drinking uh, those heavy sugar drinks, you know, add to the leaky gut syndrome, which is that's not right. going to allow your body to efficaciously that's absorb right. the cannabinoids that you're putting in. So when people say, Oh, well I tried it but it doesn't work, well how about what else are you doing that actually affected the fact that it didn't work? That's probably what we need to be talking about and I love the fact that your clinic your your goal is to make sure that a patient coming in doesn't come in and have a 10 minute conversation they come in and sit down and have an evaluation correct absolutely correct because the one thing that if you understand the, the power cannabis has had in uncovering this endocannabinoid system and you understand the physiology behind the endocannabinoid system and the pharmacology behind the cannabis plant then you understand it's bigger than that it's a lifestyle it's how you eat, how you sleep, you know, your associations with your, with your loved ones. You know, all those things are going to affect your endocannabinoid system. And I liken it, Montel, to someone putting a bandage on a sore. But if you keep putting dirt under that bandage, that sore is just not going to heal, even though you have that Band-Aid on there. So It's going to be a festival. You, yeah. Well, you know, with the I, cannabis, you have to do everything else. You have to do the rest of the story. Right. You know, I love the fact that the rest of your story, and I want to make sure that our listeners understand that your clinic, your husband, who is an ER doctor, and mm -hmm. both of your daughters, Jessica Correct. and Rachel, are both also physicians. Is that not true? That's absolutely true. And as a matter of fact, Rachel is the chair of the Oregon Cannabis Commission here and on the Minority Business Cannabis Association. And Jessica does a lot of talking. They both girls do a lot of talking around the country about cannabis as a medicine, but more importantly, how important that the real emphasis is put on understanding that science and physiology behind the endocannabinoid system because it makes everything else make sense. Traditional medicine, why it does or does not work, Chinese medicine, Indian Native American uh, medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, when you understand that science, that physiology, now you understand why things work or didn't work. And when you talk about Chinese medicine, I mean, you know, we, we know that that uh, cannabis was, you know, first appeared That's probably right. in a Chinese uh, pharmacopoeia uh, document over 5,000 years ago, yes. 3,000 years yes. B.C. Come on. Now, when we, yes. when we want to sit back and act like there hasn't been research done, I, I, it kills me when you know, I, I watch one of the, uh, you know, the FDA had that uh, panel discussion, and then, you know, two or three doctors stood up and said, well, we really need to do a little bit more research to understand. I'm going, what, what the, what, if you call yourself a doctor, read the research that's already been done and understand that the U.S. government has spent probably $50 million in the course of the last 20 years doing research outside of the United States, enough research that it guaranteed itself a patent. For CBD, exactly most people don't even understand that. And in that patent, if they were to look up the patent itself, the patent says in the extract exactly what our federal government believes CBD and cannabinoids can do. And that's, exactly. that's pretty extensive. When you, when you look at it and you say, oh, we need more research, no, we don't. Look at what the U.S. government has done already. You know, and I always say, look, I, I love double-blind clinical studies. It's helps been using cannabis for almost 5,000 years about the double-blind clinical studies. Now, does it mean we doesn't need it? Don't even let me say that or hear people saying that, but we've used this before. And once again, the patients are going to demand it. Educate yourself on the history, Montiel. The history of this whole evolution of cannabis to where we are today tells us several things. Number one why we are where we are today. Number two, let's not make the mistakes that we made before with single molecule medicines. And finally, it's going to predict what's going to happen in the future in every imaginable industry. <laughs> not just health, but you know, right. even you know, things like um, automobiles or, or uh, uh, power, clothing. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. You know, the cellulose material that's found in hemp can be strand and used uh, uh, similarly Absolutely. to graphite in a battery. And we found yeah. that, you know, hemp 
batteries literally hold more power than the typical graphite battery. And there are two companies that have gone public in the last three years that are billion-dollar-plus companies that are working on just that. Not only that, but you know, some of the waste material that we get from processing cannabis can be used to help form brick and yeah. make a brick that, that has over 100 years of lifespan. So That's you know right. we could be building buildings right now, and especially in a time when you know we have such devastation from you know uh, climate change around the world. Oh, yes. This is something yes. that could be yes. used, and it's not necessarily that much more expensive than it's it's cheaper than doing hay to to make yes. a brick. And you know I want to make sure before I, I lose the opportunity to say so at any point in time that either one of your daughters wants to appear on you know Let's Be Blunt, I'd love to have them on as a guest. I would definitely tell me, and you would get a, a, a kick out of them because they're both pretty strong women and very much support the cannabis industry. And this is a fabulous industry. This is a wonderful industry. I am so excited and continue to be excited about learning more and more. So hopefully your readers got something from, from all of this. Well, you know, I, I, I think I, I know they're going to, but I think I, I can't let you go without asking, you know, you are uh, African-American. Your husband is yes. Caucasian. You have two biracial yes. daughters. And so yes. you are a minority in this business. And this has not been a business that an industry that's been very friendly to minority participation. How have you found working yes. as a minority in a female and a minority in this that's business? That's exactly right. And how, is that, how does that work for you? That certainly has been difficult, you know, getting funding for our education program, even getting place for the brick and mortar clinics. We were always turned down, and we didn't know if it was because it was cannabis or we were females or black females in cannabis. But so that's one of the reasons we pivoted to doing mostly a telemedicine uh, platform to see patients, and we do see patients globally. But more importantly than that, I, I try to make it my mission now to tell people of color that you deserve a place at the table. You don't let them talk to you about diversity or inclusion. You talk about equity because you have paid some of the highest prices with that war on drugs. So get your positions at the table, and then we'll talk about diversity and equity. And that's because of the experiences I have. And I'm educated and still have issues. Right. Well, you know, I think part of those issues that, you know, the minority community, especially the African-American community has is because, you know, we bore the burden of all of the hate that actually manifested in this industry from 1937 on. I mean, you know, there's there's rumor when you look at Anslinger, who was, you know, one of the biggest mm -hmm. proponents early on, and people don't know this, that Anslinger literally was a proponent of cannabis during uh, 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 the time that alcohol was illegal during Prohibition, he actually suggested that more people should be smoking and using cannabis. But as soon as Prohibition was revealed, he then needed to have a job, so he decided to team up with William Randall Hearst and, and DuPont. Uh, and why? Because Hearst was chopping down all the big trees and wanted to make sure that he didn't have any competition from hemp paper, and DuPont was trying to make textiles, trying to get rid of, you know, cotton and hemp clothing, and they succeeded, you know, because, you And know, you have to remember uh, Mr. Mellon, the, the, the banking family, he was the uh, uncle-in-law of Harry Anslinger. He, he at the time, he, he was the uh, Secretary of Treasury to Herbert Hoover. He actually appointed Anslinger to be the chief of the FDA at that, at that time, which is now our NDA, to present-day NDA. But he was also into Mellon and invested very heavily in the DuPont family business. Yep. So he had a yep. motive, too. Yep, the, and all that motivation had nothing to do with this as a drug. This had to do with this of vilifying a product to make sure that you could vilify, you know, a segment of the population. And then, you know, when we look at the 50s and the 60s, this became the easiest way to arrest and incarcerate and, in well, a way, enslave people of color slavery. by putting by, uh, another form of slavery just by putting us in prisons. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but I, I, I was really interested to hear what, what you would say to other minorities who say, and especially, you know, I think we've got to spend a lot of time, you know, at the church pulpit to re-educate some of our clergy to make them right. understand that they've really had the wrong impression. They've been used yeah. as a mouthpiece to enslave our own people control our own people. And it is another form of slavery, both psychologically, economically, busting up families. I mean, that's, that's been the MO. It just was approached in a different manner by using the war on drugs. 
And as you know, that black folks were like two to three times more uh, likely to be arrested for minor possessions. That's absolutely um, a plan to keep that family apart, to maintain control. So I tell people of color wherever I go, listen, find a way to become a part of this multi-trillion dollar business. Find a way, because it can make a difference in your community, and you're right. We need to go into those churches. My father was one of those pastors, and he probably would roll over his grave if he knew what I was doing today. But he was right. very strongly against cannabis, but it was a lack of education. Right. right. Now, what do you see, you know, talk to me, if, in the perfect world, what do you see the future of your clinic being? And before you even say that, why don't you go ahead and give out your website so people can reach out to you and get more information? <laughs> Our website is uh, www.the, as in the, AC Clinics, plural, clinics is plural, dot com. And they can read, okay. us, read about us at drsnox.com. Okay. Make sure you go up on the website and find that information because I'm telling you, you'll be shocked and surprised at how much information your company really does provide. And I can't say thank you enough, Doc, for oh, yeah. providing that kind of information. But what do you see the future of your clinic? Tell me about uh, what do you, what do you, what do you yeah, hope for yeah. the future of your clinic? Yeah, and that's exciting. Number one, we really are heavy into education, correct? So we would love to train a network of clinicians, and we don't really care what the initials are behind their names, but a network of clinicians who are ready to talk to patients globally over a telemedicine platform. We firmly believe that you bring technology where it needs to be. So if technology let us talk to people globally, we want to be able to talk to patients globally. And we've had patients call us from France, from Germany, because they haven't been able to find clinicians who would talk to them. Um, but we would love to see those clinics transition into what we call smart clinics, using a telemedicine platform and seeing patients globally. But we also realize to do that, we need to train uh, providers. So we have something called Advent Academy. The first five modules are out, and they see it, they're CME certified to start training doctors, uh, pharmacologists, but we don't care who it is. Come and learn enough so that you're able to help patients use this product. So if you're worried about what the effect you have on kids' brain, or are you worried about that acute psychosis, then learn how to use it so that you help them to use it effectively and safely. And that's where the, that's the direction we see the clinic going, training and setting up the network and having a global presence. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ontario. I could talk to you for hours, and I would hope that you know maybe in a in a month you'll, you'll consider coming back to share more information with our listeners. Oh, and for all of you who have tuned in today, I can't say thank you enough. And you know, if you like what you're hearing, make sure you you know critique us and 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 uh, tell a friend and make sure they tune in to Let's Be Blunt with Montana because that's what it's all about: is being blunt, having a good, solid conversation with good information so that you can be better prepared when you go navigate a dispensary in your home state or your home city. Dr. Knox, I can't say thank you enough. Thank you so much for being a part of our show today. Love doing it. I certainly will talk to the girls. I'm sure they would love to do it as well. Absolutely. I would love to have them on. And you you be well. And then for all of you listening, remember, you know, every single day of your life, you have an opportunity to make a difference in someone else's life. And, you know, what is the value of being here on this planet if you can't help other people to live not for self alone, but to live for the betterment of mankind? That's really what it's all about. So I'm going to say thank you. Keep that thought in mind. So the next time, you know, you are walking through a door, take the time to hold the door open for somebody else. And it doesn't matter if they say thank you. Understand that your thank you comes from a bigger place. 